So welcome everyone. Thank you all for being here this morning. Uh, today we're going to be presenting on the pressure guardian system. So what we're going to look at today is a walkthrough on how to use the pressure guardian, um, an outline of the benefits using the pressure guardian in clinic, some case study presentation, then we'll have an open Q&A. And uh, Dave will also um, sort of have a live, uh, he'll, he'll connect to the pressure guardian and let's ask any questions that you may have then. Um, so we'll have that um, sort of live. Uh, Dave is a clinical prosthetist and orthotist with over 10 years of experience in neurological and high risk foot management. Notably, a frequent user of the pressure guardian within his clinic, utilizing the invaluable pressure uh, measuring and loading information that it provides to help achieve the best outcomes uh, for his patients. So without further ado, I'll uh, hand over to Dave and I'll just ask if you haven't muted your uh, microphones, please do so. Uh, Dave, over to you. Perfect. Thank you for that introduction. I'm going to share my screen with everyone. Let's see here. All right. Um, can everyone see my screen okay? Perfect. All right, so we'll just start out with a little bit of background on um, the company itself. So our company was founded as a clinical practice with a fabrication lab back in uh, 1992 by uh, Robert Tilgis. Um, and we run a pretty busy clinic and then we fab, we fab pretty much um, about 98% of our braces in-house uh, and we outsource very little. Um, we're a family owned and operated um, office. It's uh, my father and uh, four of us brothers are involved in the operation. And then we started Central Fabbing uh, Products in 2012. Um, and that's, that's shortly after when we partnered with Head to Foot um, in 2013 as a distributor in Australia. So to dive right into kind of the pressure guardian, uh, we, we use it a lot in our clinic, uh, a lot for our diabetic patient population and wound management. Uh, basically in a nutshell, it's a diagnostic tool that's gonna be used in the clinic um, on educating the patient and also making sure that you're getting um, the best results possible. It's not something that you will uh, directly send home with the patient, it's something that you will uh, solely use in clinic. It's a very compact and portable system. Um, it's easy to use and it also allows the practitioner to basically fine tune that uh, device, whether it's an orthotic device, prosthetic device, to give you the most optimal uh, results. So what the pressure guardian truly is, it's basically a, a, a pressure uh, measuring system that's going to instantaneously give you load measurements um, through an iOS app. And it's going to allow you to collect data, store it, and transmit that to um, your documentation platform, doctor's office, uh, share with your, your patients. But you can collect that data instantaneously and actually show um, the patient live feed of what those pressures are they're receiving. So here's just a few photos of the, the pressure guardians on the far, far left. We have the unit itself uh, connected to a single lead sensor, and then the iPad there with the app opened up. Um, so you can see it's very, very uh, portable and small. It's easy to connect to any device um, and allows you to uh, collect those readings during the patient's gaze. So just a list of benefits uh, that we utilize uh, in our clinic. Again, it's, it's used to collect that patient data, um, to store it to, uh, so you can historically look back and see the progress uh, that you have been making. Um, you can also document for insurance reasons or to um, give feedback to uh, referring doctor's offices. Um, it also allows you to become more of an evidence-based practice um, with the ability to show outcomes that are measurable. And it gives you uh, good biofeedback, um, which is going to increase that patient's compliance. 
a lot of our diabetic patients, um, they typically aren't the most compliant patient population. So really showing them that we have them in a device that's truly going to offload those diabetic wounds or um, areas of pressure really gives them the um, buy-in of that, that brace. And it, it really truly helps to educate not just the patient, but um, young, young clinicians, uh, people in their residencies, um, where they're first starting out, they can make adjustments to um, the braces themselves and take a before and after reading and see the um, results of that adjustment, whether it decreases the, the pressure in the desired area. And it's a great marketing tool if you're having trouble getting into any, any clinic, uh, wound clinics in the doctor's offices, uh, you can show them the technology that you have and get their buy-in on it to better serve their patients. So in our, in our clinic, we mainly use it for our diabetic patient population, the population that has a lack of feeling, that can't feel the um, wound site, so they can't really give us that feedback whether we're um, relieving the area of pressure, um, and that's where we utilize it the most. But it, it is a great tool to utilize in really any device, um, just typical orthotic bracing, scoliosis management. Um, custom seating, cranial helmets. Um, another, another great area is prosthetics um, with amputation. Sometimes the nerves are kind of relocated during that amputation. And sometimes the patient will feel pressure in one area, but they're truly receiving the pressure in another. So you can kind of um, be misled on where you need to relieve the pressure. Um, so that's by utilizing this tool, you can really pinpoint where, where you need to relieve it. So the app itself is, you can find it on the app store just under Pressure Guardian. Um, there is no cost to download it. So you can download it on multiple iOS devices. It's currently only on the iOS um, device but you can download it on as many devices as you want. So a lot of people, if you have an iPhone, it's easy to download and it's always with you. Um, and then a lot of other clinics will also have just an iPad dedicated to the clinic so they can store all their patient information on one device. So the app does consist of basically five main screens, which we will kind of go through briefly in the PowerPoint here. But then towards the end, after the case studies, I'd like to try to do a live demo where I can link to my phone and actually walk through it with you. Um, let's see here. So the, you're going to have five main screens. The, the home screen is the only one not listed here. Um, that's going to, where, going to be where you connect to the physical device. And then you have the, the stats page, which is going to show you in real time, the uh, pressure as that patient stands and ambulates. Um, and then you also have that graph page where it's gonna record. So you can see that it's recording over a 20 second period. Um, you are able to lengthen that to uh, a minute or two minutes uh, if desired in the settings. And then you have a calibration page as well. Um, so you can calibrate each sensor. So you can make sure that the sensor is recording the uh, most accurate uh, pressure uh, that, that you can measure. And then we have the patient uh, page. So this is where you're going to enter in all the patient information that it's going to store um, historically. So you can enter in uh, both, uh, um, their wound uh, size, length, width, depth. Um, where your sensors are actually positioned on the foot or the device. Um, and it's going to also record those max pressures that they're receiving, the minimum pressures and the average pressures. And then you, it's going to store that information so you can look back at it um, throughout the progress of that patient. You're also able to email these hard copies directly to the patient or their doctors or yourself um, for storage. 
So you can run, uh, so the photos you've seen so far are basically a single lead sensor to measure one site at a time, but you can run up, up to four sensors at a time. You can uh, measure in PSI or KPA, and then you can set that duration of time to 30 seconds, 60 seconds, or two minute mark. And then I'll show you some photos here in a minute. There is a calibration jig that you can use to make sure those, those sensors are accurate when doing uh, studies. And then uh, it's also gonna record again, the max, min, and average presser, pressures during the duration of that, that gate cycle. So calibration, um, it is important to calibrate, uh, especially if you're doing studies. If you if you're doing studies, I would recommend you calibrate it before every every use. Um, if you're using it just in a clinic to basically service a patient, the calibration is going to stay calibrated for um, for quite a while. We've kind of done some minor studies on it, and we've calibrated it. Uh, and it usually stays calibrated for a good couple of weeks before needing recalibration. Um, but it is, it's just important to calibrate. That way you can basically make sure that uh, the measurements that you're taking are, are very accurate. So this is a photo of the jig itself that you're gonna use to calibrate. Um, so it, it, it is fairly portable itself. It comes in a, a basically a briefcase uh, that's easy to, uh, take with you to any clinics you're going to. Um, it's pretty straightforward to calibrate. I'll kind of walk through more of that in the demo uh, at the end. And one key thing to note is when you calibrate it, it's going to be calibrated to that specific iOS device. So it's, we, it's not to be iPhone or iPad. So if you use a different I, iPad, you still want to calibrate it to that iPad. So the way calibration is done is you're going to take three set points of uh, pressure. So that jig, you're allowed to put pressure on the sensors utilizing that jig. Um, and you're going to try to take basically around a 10 PSI for the first set point, around a 20 PSI, and around a 30 PSI for the second and third set point. Um, once you've calibrated those three set points, you'll basically save that and then um, just verify uh, that the sensor has been calibrated appropriately. And again, we'll go, go through that towards the end here. So the sensors are, you are able to reuse them. Um, they are, you are able to clean and sanitize uh, the sensors. Um, typically what we recommend is you can uh, take a rubber glove and cut uh, one of the fingers off and put it over the sensor to keep it clean during use. Um, but if it does get dirty, uh, rubbing alcohol or disinfectant spray um, is easy to clean them and um, allows you to reuse them. Um, that you can also use cellophane to kind of protect the uh, sensors as well. So uh, this is this is just an offloading AFO kind of to show the use on how we utilize the uh, sensor in our clinic, but it can be again used in any type of offloading AFO that uh, you uh, solid ankle AFO with a removable inner boot. Um, and you can actually see in that boot, you're, we're able to remove that and hog out uh, where those wound sites are to kind of create a trampoline effect um, to really reduce uh, those pressures in that, that area. And that's where we'll take a before and after reading. So before we hog out that boot, we'll take a before reading, hog it out, take a after reading and see how, how far we've decreased those pressures. So this is just kind of to show, um, this is just one particular patient, but we've used uh, the sensor in one patient in all these uh, particular devices. 
and you can see the amount of pressures that uh, each device kind of changes over time. So a true offloading, which we call the Minnesota boot uh, over here, is uh, is going to give you uh, really good results on the braces, braces out there. So if you look at the bottom of the screen, this is max uh, pressure over that wound site. So throughout the gate cycle, uh, that 2.7 is the maximum uh, pressure they received. And then this next slide here is gonna be the average pressure. So uh, then you can see all the numbers drastically drop just because it, as, as they unweight the foot, that pressure is gonna to go to zero and bring down that, that average. Um, this is basically just showing again, uh, very similar uh, brace design. Uh, one thing I do want to note, uh, you can see the two straps at the calf section. Um, in the next slide or two, we're going to see a more drastic uh, calf section that's going to act more like a corset to really off weight uh, midfoot and uh, heel wounds to really grab the calf uh, like a corset and really bear the weight through the, the calf section. Yeah, so you can see we have basically a clamshell design up top around the calf uh, for these really large heel wounds to really take the weight of the patient um, in the calf and off weight the, the heel of the, the foot. So again, we, we were able to grind out um, the inner boot in those areas, creating that trampoline effect. And then as the patient heals up, we're able to backfill that with a softer foam to reduce the area of that trampoline to even take off more weight on that uh, apex of the wound. So we got uh, five case studies to kind of show you. Um, four of them are going to be basically wound uh, case studies. And well, they're all going to be wound case studies, but uh, four are going to be diabetic foot wounds. And then we have a prosthetic one uh, as well. Um, this particular patient was a 62-year-old female, um, charco deformity with a wound that uh, she had for over two years and she's been hospitalized for three times during those years and uh, just unable to get the heel uh, healed and uh, due to infection and um, other complications. Uh, she was kind of in the last ditch effort to uh, get it healed or they're looking at amputation. And utilizing the pressure guardian, we were able to get the ulcer completely healed in 28 days. So this is this is the uh, day one of fitting on the left, um, and this is the reports you'll get out of the app as well. So you can see you have the patient's date of birth, height, weight, and then uh, really really important, you have the condition of the ulcer. Um, so you have the 15 by 10 by 5. So at each, each follow-up visit, you can remeasure that and kind of um, see the progress you're making. And you can see already on the right side, uh, on day 7 of the follow-up visit, how much smaller that already is and the, the uh, tissue around it, how much healthier it looks. And then we followed up uh, day 21, and you can see the wound is now at three, six, and two and a half. And then uh, day 28, it is almost fully healed. So this is a 63-year-old male, um, again, with diabetes, pests, uh, uh, cavus foot deformity um, that it's battling a wound for the past six months uh, and again the doctor was looking at amputation for the patient. This one did take uh, longer to heal about 70 days to kind of fully heal um, but it is a much larger wound as well and it's directly over the heel so 
at heel strike is is where they they uh, is he's going to get the most most pressure, um, and that's what's nice about the graphs on these two. So you can you can really see it in the second photo on the right, where you're getting that peak kind of pressure at that two two psi. That's going to be if you watch the patient walk and you record it, you're going to see that at heel strike. That's where he's getting that peak planner uh, pressure. So by looking at the rocker of the device and making it more uh, fluid motion, uh, we were able to bring that down as much as possible. And then um, again, it's just, it's really easy to see clearly the progress this patient's making. And then on day 70, um, he's fully healed. So we have a 76 year old male uh, diagnosed with left charcoal deformity. Um, again, open wound for over 10 months. Uh, he's been working with uh, wound clinics, uh, trying to get it healed. And interesting enough, this, this gentleman came in wearing uh, sandals. So no, no orthotic device, nothing to really relieve the pressure. Um, so it really, it really comes down to compliance too on a patient like this, um, really educating them that it's, it's, it's a pressure made sore due to your foot deformity. So giving them a really good orthotic device that's gonna allow for offloading and then actually showing him um, the pressures that you're able to reduce. So for this particular patient, we, we took a reading of the pressures um, in his sandal uh, over the wound site and then in the um, offloading AFO. Unfortunately, I don't have the, the uh, pressures that he was getting in the sandal, but uh, they, they were significantly higher than uh, what we're seeing here. So generally with a lot of these patients, you can see they're over 200 pounds. Um, this particular one's 250 pounds, but you can see the pressures we're getting are below um, three pounds of pressure over that wound site. For, for most of our population, that's we're aiming for under five pounds of uh, pressure um, for pretty much any weight and height. So a 65 year old male diagnosed with diabetes, neuropathy, um, and he's basically had an open ulcer for about 63 days at this, at this point, uh, wearing custom inserts uh, within his tennis shoes. So you can see on him, he's actually got two wounds, uh, ones on the lateral aspect of his foot and then the plantar surface. And this one, you can actually see we're utilizing uh, multiple sensors to take those pressure readings. So. In the graphs, you can see the two different colored uh, sensors. And then in the uh, data, you can also see the max uh, pressure in the first and second sensor. And you can see the locations of each sensor as well. Okay. So this gentleman is a below the amputee and the photo is really hard to see, but he does have a small wound um, over the fibular head where he's getting pressure inside his, his prosthetic socket. Um, so this is where uh, it's, really, it's really nice. He's already in a device um, to take a pressure, um, a pressure measurement prior to making any adjustments. So in this particular uh, case, the first reading we took was he was getting about eight pounds of pressure while walking on his prosthetic in that uh, area. After we've made the adjustment, um, we retook that measurement and the max pressure he was getting in that area was uh, just above half a pound. So it really makes uh, the clinician's job really nice and easy because you can you can save yourself almost a follow-up appointment by knowing that you've relieved the pressure in that exact area on these patients. Um, so you don't necessarily have to schedule the follow-up appointment on a patient like this um, unless they don't see it healing in, in a couple of weeks. 
Okay, I'm going to try to jump before we end. And I want to try to jump onto the app itself. So I'm going to minimize this. If you guys have any, while, while Dave is doing that, if you guys have any questions, just pop it in the chat and uh, we will address that uh, as we continue on with the webinar. So is there is there a way to maximize my screen, uh, my personal screen where, oh, here, let me actually do this. I'm going to share. Okay, so you guys see my desktop, right? Yes. Okay, let's see if I can maximize this. Trying to make this as big as possible so you can see it. Okay. So, okay. I don't know if you can see that jig in front of me now. We can see the jig. What's that? Yeah, we can see the jig. Perfect. All right, now I'm just gonna to connect to the phone here. So we'll run through the app here real quick. So you guys can see the app open on the left side of the screen? Yep. Perfect. All right, so you're gonna, you're basically gonna select the logo to connect to the uh, unit itself, which I have on in front of me as well. Um, and. For those of you that have units currently, um, you may have a Wi-Fi unit, which is gonna be slightly different than the demo we go through today. Uh, we did in the last couple of years launch a Bluetooth uh, unit, uh, which just allows it uh, easier connecting. Uh, so it's, it works all off Bluetooth now. So you select the app and then the logo is gonna change uh, gold uh, notifying you that you have indeed uh, connected. Now we're going to go over to our stats page here. So right now we're getting zero pressure readings and the reading is going to be taken over this three eighths inch dot here. So as I push on that, you're going to see that needle kind of go up. Now you can, you can kind of break in the sensor just by letting your uh, fingers put pressure on it just to kind of warm that sensor up before you put it on any uh, patient device or calibrate it. It's nice just to kind of get it to uh, warm up a little bit. So what we're going to do is we're going to put it in this jig here. And then what I always want to do after putting it in the jig, I want to make sure that the uh, app is reading zero pounds of pressure uh, just to make sure that the sensor is not pinched in the jig. So we can clearly see Okay, it actually just uh, spiked a little bit there. So we might have it pinched. Or another thing that it could be is there might be some uh, air trapped in the line. So we can bleed that out, which I just did with the button here. And it looks like it stopped spiking on us. So, uh, so we should be not pinched in the jig and we should be ready for calibration. Before I calibrate it, I can just see if how close we are to um, accurate right now. So what I'm gonna be doing, which is gonna be very number on the jig here and seeing if it matches the number on my screen, which I'm off about a, about a PSI or so. So about one pound per square inch. So it does look like we need to calibrate this. So I'm gonna jump to the calibration page. 
and I'm just going to bleed this out one more time. So at this point, what I'm going to do is at each set point, I'm just going to give it one pump on the on the jig here, and then I'm going to let the jig kind of settle. And right now it's reading 8.9, so I'm going to put that in. And click calibrate. So as you can see, the calibrate's got those three dots on the side. It's it's taking multiple readings per second to average them all out. And now that that set point is done there, we're going to give it another pump, move to set point two. Let the jig settle and it's settling at 17.9. And we're going to hit calibrate. And then as that's calibrating, I'm just moving to set point three to get it ready. And that set point one is finished. So we're going to go to another pump into the jig. Let that settle, and now it's reading 26.8. And we're going to hit calibrate. So after that's done calibrating, um, you can hit the return button, which I hit a little early, which is fine. But once all three set points are done calibrating, I'm going to come up here and hit the save button. Now, if I wanted to calibrate um, multiple sensors, if I was doing four sensors, before I hit that save button, I would swipe over to sensor two, un unhook sen uh, the sensor in the jig and hook in sensor two and uh, do the steps over again. Uh, once we're all done calibrating all the sensors we want, we can go back to the stats page. And now I can see that it's reading around 20, high 26 to uh, low 27s. And I can verify using my jig that that's, uh, accurate currently. Um, you might have a variance of uh, half a PSI or so, but it should be pretty accurate. And then you can, when you're slowly bleeding that air out, you can just take another reading. So it's reading 16.9 on the jig for me, and I'm, I'm right close to that PSI. And then I'll just do it one more time. So now I know we're getting accurate readings. So we can pop that out. I'm going to set the jig aside. Now we're able to take recordings. So just to show you a couple of recordings. So right now I just have the one sensor. I could swipe to the left here and show all four sensors, which I don't have currently hooked up. I just have the one. So that's the only one we're seeing um, as I push on this sensor. So this is where you can get live feedback and view it. So as I'm going to hit record here. So you just tap on the screen to record and now it's recording those pressures. So you can visually see the average, the max, the min um, as, as they go, or you can move over to the graph page here and truly see where are they getting those peak planner, uh, peak planner pressures. So is that heel strike? Is it at toe off? I'm just gonna go back and record that again. Is it, so you can see truly where they're getting it. And I've had patients where Truly, they didn't need uh, an orthotic device. They just needed to be educated. I had a patient who had a wound on the uh, base of the fifth, um, uh, base of the fifth, and it was because he was really walking with his toes to uh, toed in, and he was rolling right over that base of the fifth. And just by externally rotating his hip and having him walk we were able to reduce the pressures from about 50 PSI down to about five PSI. Um, so just by educating them on gait, um, we were able to reduce those pressures quite a bit. Um, and then uh, we have the patient uh, tab here. So that's where you're gonna enter all your patient information, which we can do just real quick, but I like to save some time for questions. I won't take too long. I won't fill out everything here. So we do we do have a question, um, Dave. And the yeah. first question is, do you recommend using PSI? We have found that calibration seems more consistent when compared to calibrating with the app set in kilopascals KPA. Yeah. Um, I'll be honest, I, I've always done it in PSI, so I guess I would have to play with it a little bit in, uh, in the metric uh, system just to experiment. So I don't have a great answer 
Um, but I can say when I have used PSI, I've, I've been pretty accurate with the readings. Yeah, so Peter, if, if, you're, if you're finding calibration more consistent with PSI, then um, continue using PSI. And the number two, I think you covered this, Dan, but how frequently should we calibrate? Yeah, um, if if you're doing it like a study, if you if you're trying to get published or if you're doing any any type of study with uh, doctors or anything, I would calibrate it before every use, just to verify that you're getting the most accurate result. Um, but if if you're going to if you're going to use it in clinic as an education tool um, for staff, an education tool for uh, new clinicians. Um, or an education tool for patients. I, I, I don't think you necessarily need to calibrate it every time. Um, the longest I've gone without calibrating it was three weeks. And you can, you can before you calibrate it, uh, you can even just put it in the jig and test it and see um, how accurate it is. And if it's accurate, there's no need to calibrate it. Um, but yeah. No, fantastic. Any other question, guys? We, this webinar has been recorded, so you will receive a, a copy of this uh, later in this week or early next week. Um, but yeah, just let us know. I'll give you a couple of minutes or so if you have any questions. Here comes one. Should we be very cautious when educating for different gait? Take care to assess that, is, that it is modifiable rather than fixed. I, can you, can you receive, say that, please? Should we be very cautious when educating for different gait? Um, should we take care to assess that it is modifiable rather than a fixed deformity? Yeah, so if I'm understanding that correctly, um, if, if they have a fixed deformity that they're, it, I mean, some fixed deformities, I mean, their gait's gonna be what their gait is and we have to accommodate it, so. Um, if they do have a fixed deformity, we're, we're going to have to accommodate that with some type of orthotic device. Um, I think, it, it, is that kind of what the question is? Does that answer the question, Shay, or are you able to just rephrase that a little bit? You want to just unmute Shane and just okay, it does answer the uh, question. Uh, yep, does... Sorry, the, can yeah, you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you, Shane. Oh, cool. Yeah, no, I just I'm just conscious that um, if if many of these people are like me, I tend to default to habit um, as soon as I'm out of the clinic. Um, and so I suppose uh, I was cautious when you were suggesting that you know, say someone could. Um, remember to internal externally rotate a little bit to offload that fifth um, uh, in the case that you identified. I guess I, I was just sort of thinking about caution because I suspect that people revert um, very easily and that or an ongoing orthosis might be a more guaranteed way to offload. Yeah, yeah. So you're you're absolutely right. Um, so this gentleman, uh, we did put in just for orthotics, but we also recommended uh, PT for him. Oh, um, good. Yeah. For for that reason, because old habits are very hard to uh, get rid of. Um, but we we didn't want to overbrace um, that particular gen and that was that was a really rare case too. I I don't expect to see that myself. Um, at least the results we saw that quickly just by a gate change. Um, that was quite drastic, uh, in my opinion. But uh, but it, it 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 was amazing just a little tweak to his gate how much how much pressure it can really be relieved. Right. Uh, another one, uh, Dave. It's uh, how would you use it for cranial as well as for scoliosis to get. Reading so those, yeah. those are going to be definitely more challenging. Um, I personally have not used it for either. Um, I do know a couple of clinicians that have, and they, the sensors, uh, the sensors are very flexible. So typically, you're going to cut slits in the plastic of the uh, braces, 
And before donning, you're going to hook the sensors through those slits and uh, just basically bend them right down to the wall of the, the device and uh, tape them in. Um, it, it's not, in those two situations, I don't know how, how important it truly is um, to measure. Again, you're only measuring over a three eighths inch dot. So it's, uh, especially in the Scully case, it's a, a very small area that you're gonna be measuring um, comparative, but uh, we have had uh, clinicians that found it valuable in those situations. Cool. I'll try and get a little more information on that for you, Rose, and um, uh, perhaps email it through to you once um, I have a chat with Dave. Any other questions, guys? Or Okay, great. Well, thanks, Dave. And uh... oh, here we go. Sorry, we got well, one more. Chris from... You mentioned keeping below three PSI. Is there a general um, good. Is there a general adjourance on what pressure and above is unsafe for the insensate foot? Yeah, so it's we've we've looked. Uh, I I did my thesis uh, paper on diabetic wounds and management, and there really is no sound. Um, source out there for what PSI or what pressure we should be below. And the reason I think that it's really difficult to pin down is every patient is uniquely diff different with blood circulatory system, um, weight, height, um, how uh, their gait is, um, just the overall structure of their tissues as well. So it's very difficult to kind of pinpoint what is a safe value. Uh, but what, what we have found is if the patient is compliant and we're able to get uh, truly even under 10 PSI, most of these patients are coming in with uh, pressures 30 and above. Um, uh, but our goal is to always get them under uh, five PSI. And if we're, if we're truly able to get them under there and they're compliant, um, typically, always we see we see healing in these patients unless they have some underlying other issue like an infection um, that can be holding them back. But compliance is a big one. Um, when I did my thesis, we we utilized a, a piece of equipment called an ortho timer, which I don't even know if they make anymore, but it, it measures body heat, um, so you can tell when the patient's actually wearing it. And it was very interesting to see in the patients that were wearing it um, all day long, uh, you saw a lot better healing than someone that would wear it um, half the day or three quarters of the day. It really doesn't take long to uh, re-injure that uh, soft tissue where that ulcer is. Um, so we try to educate our patients, even if you get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, um, either you utilize the device or don't put weight through that foot, utilize crutches, a wheelchair or something um, to get you from point A to point B with the zero, zero pressure over that wound. Right. Um, have you used, uh, have you used the sensor in a total contact cast? Uh, say that again. I, I missed that first part. Have you used uh, to get pressure readings in a total contact cast? Yeah, so I personally have not used uh, the sensor and I'm trying to remember back to my thesis because we did, I was able to find research on uh, pressures in total contact cast uh, comparative to um, orthotic devices. I don't, I can't remember the exact numbers off the top of my head, but it was, it was drastically different um, pressures in uh, orthotic device comparative to uh, total contact. I want to say it was something like about 20% uh, the pressure in an actual orthotic device comparative to uh, total contact. The how having said that though, compliance is the interesting part there because a total contact cast your patient has to be compliant; they can't take it off. Um, 
So the total contact casts aren't um, aren't necessarily a bad thing if you have a non-compliant patient. Sure. Um, and is there is there much data available on how much PSI can be safely tolerated in healthy young patients, uh, particularly in the context of pectus cranium bracing? Oh, that's a good one. I um, I don't see much pectus bracing, um, so I don't I don't have a clear answer on that either. I can maybe do a little bit of digging. Um, but I, I would kind of assume, and I might be off base here again, I, I'm not an expert in that area, but I would kind of assume it's fairly like scoliosis where you can push pretty hard, um, but I, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but in, in some of our scoliosis patients, I mean, we're, we're pushing, I'm sure we're pushing above 75 to 100 PSI. Uh, but again, those are those are patients that aren't aren't diabetic. They don't have the the brittle skin. They don't have that uh, easy breakdown of tissues, um, so you can get away with those higher pressures. Understood. Well, thanks, Sam. Really appreciate your your time, uh, and thank you all for uh, attending. And like I said, this will be recorded. So this is recorded, and it will be sent out uh, to you. Um, in the coming days. So thanks everyone. Yeah, thanks for coming. Thanks for putting this together, Steve. It was a great time seeing everyone. Cheers.